Hello everyone. This is another presentation on myofunctional appliance and this time we will talk about activator therapy. Hope this will be helpful to you guys. Activator is also known as biomechanic working retainer. Anderson appliance. Nocturnal airway patency appliance. Norwegian appliance. Monoblock. Kingsley or bite jumping appliance. The first removable functional appliance, developed by V. Anderson. Historically, the term activator was introduced to describe the activation of mandibular growth, to which the achieved correction of a class II malocclusion was attributed. These appliances position the mandible forward, promoting a new mandibular postural position. The reactive forces from the stretch of the muscles and soft tissues are transmitted to the maxillary dentition and through that, to the maxilla. The acrylic body of the Anderson activator covers part of the palate and the lingual aspect of the mandibular alveolar ridge. A labial bow fits anterior to the maxillary incisors and carries you loops for adjustment. On the palatal aspects of the maxillary incisors, the acrylic is relieved to allow their retraction. Now talking about efficacy of the activator. According to Anderson and Hoppel, the activator is effective in exploiting the interrelationship between function and changes in internal bone structure. The activator induces musculoskeletal adaptation by introducing a new pattern of mandibular closure. Neuromuscular adaptation to the increased distance and changes in direction is the basic requirement for re-educating the orofacial musculature. The adaption in the functional pattern caused by the activator and also include and affect the condyles. Condylar adaptation to anterior positioning of the mandible consists of growth in an upward and backward direction to maintain the integrity of TMJ structures. This adaptation is induced by a loose appliance. The construction bite does not open the mandible beyond postural rest position. Myotatic reflex activity is stimulated, causing isometric muscle contraction. This muscle force transmitted by the appliance moves the teeth. Thus the appliance works by kinetic energy. Although Anderson's and Hoppel's original concept and working hypothesis have been discussed and practiced for 55 years, they are still controversial, some authorities accept some or all of their ideas, whereas others completely reject them. Now different classifications of views. Depending on the construction of the appliance, the activator can initiate myotatic reflex activity, induce isometric muscle contractions, sometimes also inducing isotonic contractions, or rely on the viscoelastic properties of the stretched soft tissues. According to the mode of action, two main principles apply. A third approach combines the two rationales. According to the original Anderson Hoppel concept, the forces generated in activator therapy are caused by muscle contractions and myotatic reflex activity. A loose appliance stimulates the muscle, and the moving appliance moves the teeth. The muscles function with kinetic energy, and intermittent forces are clinically significant. According to the second working hypothesis, the appliance is squeezed between the jaws in a splinting action. The appliance exerts forces that move the teeth in this rigid position. The stretch reflex is activated, inherent tissue elasticity is operative, and strain occurs without functional movement. The appliance works using potential energy. For this mode of action an overcompensation of the construction bite in the sagittal or vertical plane is necessary. An efficient stretch action is achieved by overcompensation and the viscoelastic properties of the contiguous soft tissues. Next, we will discuss about skeletal and dentoalveolar effects of the activator. Any skeletal effect from the activator depends on the growth potential. Two divergent growth vectors propel the jaw bases in an anterior direction. A. The sphenoccipital synchondrosis moves the cranial base and nasomaxillary complex up and forward. B. The condyle translates the mandible in a downward and forward direction. The activator is most effective in controlling the lower vector or the downward and forward growth of the mandible. Johnston attributes this response to unloading the condyle. Only the upward and backward growth of the condyle is capable of moving the mandible anteriorly. As the research by Petrovich has shown, the lateral pterygoid muscle plays a decisive role in this growth. Forward posturing of the condyle activates the superior head of the LPM. 
In young people, this induces a cell proliferation in the condyle and a growth response. The dental alveolar effect of the activator is to control tooth eruption and alveolar bone apposition. For this reason, the activator is most effective if used in the early mixed dentition. With proper trimming of the appliance, different movements can be performed and the eruption of the teeth can be guided. Two principles are employed in the modern activator. Force application, the source is usually muscular. Force elimination, the dentition is shielded from normal and abnormal functional and tissue pressures by pads, shields, and wire configurations. A. In the sagittal plane the mandible is propelled down and forward so that muscle force is delivered to the condyle and a strain is produced in the condylar region. A slight reciprocal force can be transmitted to the maxilla during this maneuver. B. Vertical plane The teeth and alveolar processes are either loaded with or relieved of normal forces. If the construction bite is high, a greater strain is produced to the contiguous tissues. If transmitted to maxilla these forces can inhibit growth increment and direction and influence the inclination of maxillary base. C. In the transverse plane, forces also can be created with midline corrections. Various active elements, example, springs, screws, can be built into the activator to produce an active biomechanic type of force application. Now let's talk about construction bite. Proper activator fabrication requires the determination and reproduction of the correct construction or working bite. The purpose of this mandibular manipulation is to relocate the jaw in the direction of treatment objectives. This creates artificial functional forces and allows assessment of the appliance's mode of action. Before taking the construction bite, the clinician must prepare by making a detailed study of the plaster casts, cephalometric and panoral head films, and the patient's functional pattern. Diagnostic Preparation Creating an instant correction, moving the mandible forward into an anterior more normal sagittal relationship, may help motivate patients with class 2 malocclusions. Now about treatment planning. The extent of anterior positioning for class 2 malocclusion and posterior positioning for class 3 malocclusions should be determined. Anterior Positioning of the Mandible the usual intermaxillary relationship for the average class 2 problem is end-to-end -end incisal. However, it should not exceed 7 to 8 mm, or three-quarters of the mesiodistal dimension of the first permanent molar, in most instances. Anterior positioning of this magnitude is contraindicated if any of the following pertain. 1. The overjet is too large. 2. Labial tipping of the maxillary incisors is severe. 3.An incisor, usually a lateral, has erupted markedly to the lingual, the mandible must be postured anteriorly to an edge-to-edge -edge relationship with the lingually malposed tooth, otherwise, labial movement of this tooth will be impossible. Eschler, 1952, termed the condition a pathologic construction bite. As with severely proclined upper incisors, use of a short prefunctional appliance to improve alignment of lingually malposed teeth is advisable before starting activator treatment, thereby eliminating the need for the pathologic construction bite. Opening the bite. Vertical considerations are as important as the sagittal determination and are intimately linked to it. Maintaining a proper horizontal vertical relationship and determining the height of the bite are guided by the following principles. 1. The mandible must be dislocated from the postural resting position in at least one direction, sagittally or vertically. This dislocation is essential to activate the associated musculature and induce dot a strain in the tissues. 2. Dot if the magnitude of the forward position is great, 7 or 8 mm, the vertical opening should be minimal so as not to overstretch the muscles. This type of construction bite produces an increased force component in the sagittal plane, allowing a forward positioning of the mandible. 3. If extensive vertical opening is needed, the mandible must not be anteriorly positioned. If the bite opening exceeds 6 mm, mandibular protraction must be very slight. Myotatic reflex activity of the muscles of mastication can then be observed, as can a stretching of the soft tissues. The vertical relationship, either deep bite or open bite, can be therapeutically affected by the activator. Disadvantages of a wide open construction bite include the difficulty of wearing the appliance and adapting to the new relationship. 
muscle spasms often occur, and the appliance tends to fall out of the mouth. The high construction bite also makes lip seal difficult if not impossible. The ultimate re-establishment of normal lip seal is essential in functional appliance therapy. General Rules for the Construction Bite The assessment of the construction bite determines the kind of muscle stimulation, frequency of mandibular movements, and duration of effective forces. In a forward positioning of the mandible of 7 to 8 mm the vertical opening must be slight to moderate, 2 to 4 mm. 2. If the forward positioning is no more than 3 to 5 mm the vertical opening should be 4 to 6 mm. 3. The activator can correct lower midline shifts or deviations only if actual lateral translation of the mandible itself exists. If the midline abnormality is caused by tooth migration, no asymmetric relationship exists between the mandible and maxilla. An attempt to correct this type of dental problem could lead to iatrogenic asymmetry. Functional crossbites in the functional analysis can be corrected by taking the proper construction bite. A construction bite prepared on casts may have the following disadvantages. It may not fit. Asymmetric biting may have occurred on it. The patient may not be really comfortable and may be disturbed more frequently during sleep. The likelihood of unwanted lower incisor procumbency may be greater because the appliance exerts undue stress on these teeth. Management of the appliance If the patient is wearing the activator without difficulty and following instructions, checkup appointments should be scheduled every six weeks. During these office visits the clinician should maintain rapport with the patient, reinforce motivation, and perform the following procedures. 1. All guide planes that have been ground and all areas in contact with the teeth should be observed for shiny surfaces that indicate whether the appliance is being worn correctly and is working properly. 2. Reshaping of acrylic guide areas may be required after initial trimming to improve function, it also may be needed during the course of treatment to ensure continued tooth movement, particularly in the upper arch, if retrusion or distalization is desired. Maxillary change is usually minimal at best, however. If the permanent teeth are erupting, reshaping also may be motion of the appliance in the mouth may change wire configurations and occasionally fatigues wires sufficiently to cause necessary. 3. Acrylic contact guide planes often must be resealed or recontoured to maintain the proper functional activation on the desired teeth by adding self-curing soft acrylic in a thin layer. Clinical examination of the acrylic inclined planes for shiny spots helps determine the amount of sealing to be done. 4. The labial bows and any additional wire elements must be checked for action and possible deformation. The active bow should touch the teeth. The passive bow should position away from the teeth but remain in contact with the soft tissues. The guiding and stabilizing wires are activated by the patient's biting into the appliance. 6. In expansion treatment the jack screws are normally activated by the patient at two-week intervals. The clinician should check this activation for too frequent or infrequent activation. Too much activation prevents the appliance from fitting properly. The activation interval may need to be changed. Indications of activator It is primarily used in actively growing individuals with favorable growth pattern. The maxillary and mandibular teeth should be well aligned. The mandibular incisors should be upright over the basal bone. The following are some of the indications for the use of activator. 1. Class 2, Division 1 Malocclusion 2. Class 2, Division 2 Malocclusion. 3. Class 3 Malocclusion. 4. Class 1 Open Bite Malocclusion. 5. Class 1 Deep Bite Malocclusion. 6. As a preliminary treatment before major fixed appliance therapy. To improve skeletal jaw relations. 7. For post treatment retention. 8. Children with lack of vertical development in lower facial height. Contraindications of activator therapy 1. The appliance is not used in correction of class 1 problems of crowded teeth caused by disharmony between tooth size and jaw size. 2. The appliance is contraindicated in children with excess lower facial height and extreme vertical mandibular growth. 3. The appliance is not used in children whose lower incisors are severely procumbent. 
for, the appliance cannot be used in children with nasal stenosis caused by structural problems within the nose or chronic untreated allergy. 5. The appliance has limited application in non-growing individuals. Advantages of Activator Therapy 1. It uses existing growth of the jaws. 2. During treatment the patient experiences minimal oral hygiene problems. 3. The intervals between appointments is long. 4. The appointments are usually short due to need for minimal adjustments. 5. Due to the above reasons they are more economical. Disadvantages of Activator Therapy 1. Requires very good patient cooperation. 2. The activator cannot produce a precise detailing and finishing of the occlusion, thus post-treatment fixed appliance therapy may be needed for detailing of the occlusion. 3. It may produce moderate mandibular rotation, anteriorly downwards. Thus activators are not used in cases of excessive lower face height. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe for more such content. Bye. See you soon.